morning, everybody. No, that's okay, energy, I guess. Hopefully it will build as the surface goes on. Um, happy Sabbath. I'm loving this scorching heat outside. Isn't it so great? We're thinking positive, right? Maybe it'll feel cooler if we're happy about it. Um, anyways, I would love for you guys to stand and sing the song with us. I hope I, hope I can hear you singing because it's a really beautiful song that I think you guys will know. Um, anybody have any jokes? Why don't you take some time to say hi to your neighbor, see how they're doing.
can be seated. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to you all. Glad you all are here. Welcome. Those of you who are viewing online, welcome to you as well. It took me a second to remember that we have new cameras, uh, actually one new camera and one camera repositioned. <laughs> anyway, and it's repositioned. So I was looking over that corner right there. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Uh, welcome to you all. Glad you're here again today. Um, as we uh, start our announcements, I want to say to Gordon and Donnette, thank you for the wonderful potluck last week. That was fantastic. It was wonderful. Thank you so much for, for uh, um, providing that venue and uh, making your home, your backyard available to everyone. And I know that Gene and Trish, they, they knew that they were loved. I think they knew they were loved even before that. And that was really a confirmation, right? So thank you for hosting that uh, event last week. Hey, uh, next Sabbath, there is a, a fellowship luncheon at the Van Zant's house. And this is for the grief care team. Okay, so a couple of months ago, we had a great gr grief care training that was held, and this is a follow-up meeting for those of you who attended uh, that training. Next Sabbath, Fellowship Lunch and the Van Zants, and we'll continue our planning and organization and how we can be effective in, um, better effective in, in uh, supporting and encouraging people, one another, who are going through grief. So if you were part of that, I want to remind you of that. Also, uh, tomorrow, eve, tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m. is a baby shower for Jesse. And uh, that's at 10 o'clock at, uh, at the Stevens house, Roy and Mary's house. And uh, that will be super fun. So um, make plans to be there if you haven't already and support, uh, support her. Ninth grade at RAA. That's exciting too, isn't it? Yeah, ninth grade, a teacher has been found, a teacher has been hired, and uh, he's coming from Idaho. Mm -hmm. Little trade-off there. We like to steal from Idaho. We'll steal from Idaho as well. Yeah, good. And uh, he's going to be coming here, moving here this summer and teaching ninth grade. If you know of someone who might be kind of thinking about what are some options for ninth grade, Contact the school, call Carrie, and uh, she'd be happy to uh, answer any of your questions. Pastor Katrina, what else do you have for us this morning? Well, we have a fun event happening on Monday. We do. It's, I call it a fun event because it's going to be fun. And you know how I know it's going to be fun? Because there's ice cream. I was going to say because we're all going to be there together. Oh, yeah, that's true too. Yeah. I went sentimental with it. Yeah. But there's also going to be ice cream, so there's that. Please join us this coming Monday at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. We're going to have our church business meeting. It's a great time to look at what God is doing in our church and also, equally importantly, to look at the budget. That's right. Because we have to do that sometimes, like any other family. Um, in other news, let's move on. Um, Father's Day is the 19th of June. For those of you who were wondering if Father's Day was still a thing, it is. And um, we recognize our fathers. We love our dads. You guys are fantastic, which is why we're going to have a whole potluck brunch in your honor. Right on. Yeah, we're going to have pancakes and other brunch related items. Yeah. And a treasure hunt for the kids. The real treasure, guys. It's your dad. <laughs> I've got all the good ones. All you the do. good little yeah. heart tugs. <laughs> All right. Um, one more thing, just as a reminder, we are raising money to do our vacation Bible school this summer. It's, it's a big undertaking, but it's our big evangelistic push for our kiddos. And so if you want to give to that, you can literally just put on your tithe envelope VBS. Or if you're doing Adventist online giving, you can click on the one that says the vacation Bible school. That's right. So either way works for us. We are so glad that you guys are here. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us, whether it's in person, surrounded by 
you know, your friends and family who are all touching you in this heat. I don't know why. Um, or if you're sitting in your air-conditioned home away from other people, not being touched, that, that's okay, too. We love you, too. At this time, Auntie Donette has a special story for our kiddos. So, kids, make sure you make your way to the back and grab your little baskets and come through. Make the super cute smiley faces at all of the adults as they give you money. Some ones, some tens, some twenties, whatever it is. We're missing a lot of kids today. Usually this is full. Hey, the story I have, it's about a little girl. Her name is Natalia. And this is a real story. When, when Natalia, this is back in 1980, which was way before you were born. It was probably before even lots of these mommies were born. Well, Natalia had a pet when she was growing up. She had a pet turtle. It was a tortoise. It was, it was big. Have you ever owned a tortoise? Oh, she loved this tortoise. And she took care of it every day. She'd give it food and water. She would talk to it, and she would say, hi there, little girl, how are you doing? And she would pet the tortoise. And she'd get a toothbrush, and she'd clean it. She loved it. And when Natalia was eight years old, guess what happened? No, it didn't. She didn't have to sell it. She couldn't find it. She looked everywhere, and they could not find the tortoise. The tortoise's name was Manuela. They looked everywhere for Manuela. And they thought, would it have gotten out of it? Because they kept it in their house. Would it have kept, got out of the yard? They looked all over the yard, nothing. There weren't any spots where something might have dug under the fence and gotten loose. Manuela was nowhere. She cried. Would you cry if your pet got lost? Yeah, I would too. Well, it was gone for months. Then it was gone for a year. Then it was gone for two years, and nobody found Manuela. And it was really sad, because they loved this tortoise. Well, more time went by, and they gave up. And one day, the grandpa died. He was very old. It was 30 years later, and the grandpa died. 
And they were cleaning out the house. And they started sorting through things. The brothers and sisters all came. They all were looking at their favorite pictures. And they started choosing things that they might want to have for their family. And they finished downstairs. And then the grandma says, well, I got some bad news for you. We haven't done the upstairs attic yet. And they're like, the upstairs attic. Oh, no, that's where they hid all their junk. So they all went upstairs to the attic. And they started cleaning and sorting. And they saw this old speaker, you know, kind of a speaker. See that black speaker up there that's on the pole or that one over there? Well, it was an old wood box speaker that was broken that they didn't even use anymore. And they said, should we just throw this away? Nobody wants it. There's nothing in it. They go over and look at the speaker, and they pulled it to the door, and they looked inside. Do you know, 30 years later, do you know what they found inside the speaker? The tortoise. It had been in there. <laughs> Was that the pastor that just said that? <laughs> they looked in there. The tortoise was alive. 30, yeah. Yeah, Glenn, the tortoise was alive. <laughs> I don't know what it smelled like in there, but the tortoise was alive and had been using the speaker hole as its house. And for 30 years, they were shocked and amazed and Natalia is grown now and even has her kids of her own. She's 38. So she took the tortoise to a veterinarian, you know, an animal doctor. And it showed him, he goes, how can this be? Our 30-year-old turtle, tortoise, is alive upstairs and no one's gone up there for years. And he said, well, he's up. He, and they go, what? And they go, it's not Manuela. It should be Manuel. <laughs> so all those years, they thought they had a girl tortoise that they were talking so sweet to. It's a boy tortoise. <laughs> and he's, they said, well, how could he still be alive? What did he eat? Nobody's been feeding him. He goes, well, it has been eating termites and termite larvae, and cockroaches, and anything else. And that is what this tortoise has been living on for 30 years. Is that not amazing? And so she kept the tortoise at her own house now. And she had the tortoise for 10 more years. That was the end of that story. She might still have it. No one said what happened to it after 10 more years. But do you know what that reminds us of? In Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I think Natalia, why would she ever think about looking up in the attic? Do you think a tortoise could climb the stairs to go to an attic? I don't think so. But if she felt if she'd searched harder, maybe she would have found them, found the tortoise a long time ago. But remember that, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I have something for you. You can come and pick one. I have all different kinds here. Yeah, some of them are sea turtles, but most of them are regular turtles and tortoises.
Good morning. It's a beautiful day. Probably in a couple of hours. I might not say that. It might be a little warmer. Um, today's offering, I think all of you know how to give, what to give, where to give. Um, if you're a guest, we're just glad that you're here. Thank you for being here. Um, does anybody have a testimony of joy or a testimony of any kind that they want to share with us today? I'm waiting. Mm -hmm. And I was just telling Pastor Glenn, we got here on Monday to visit our son and new grandson. And, um, but the past three weeks prior to that, we've been working with a, a team called Streams of Light. Have you guys heard of that? You will be. It, uh, Elder Ted Wilson wants the great controversy in every home by 2026 and the goal in st louis was 90,000 books put out last week and we did pretty good at our church we had 17,000 something and we got we're barely over half now so they just texted me and i i hope this is from streams of light or whatever we've been experiencing a lot of people finding out about god's sabbath and just walking into the church and, and really growing. And anyway, they just texted me and told me they had so many visitors today that we have no way to feed them all or, or anything. So I want to praise God for that. I don't know where they're coming from, what they're coming from. But if you guys get the opportunity to do that, I would strongly suggest it. We, we went to houses that were over a million dollars in the area, Nat. And there were ladies that lived in them homes that were crying and broken and not happy and everything else. It changes lives. It changes lives. Thank you so much. It's time for a prayer for all of us, if you wish to kneel. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we belong to you, that you love us no matter what, no matter what we did yesterday or what we'll do tomorrow, that your love never changed for us. We hope that we tell you every day that we trust you. The world tries to enslave us with fear. Um, the world and the news and even our friends sometimes get lost in, in fear. But you have filled us and you have freed us. You are the God that loves us and died for us and has a plan for us and knows where we're going when we go. And we look forward to that, Lord. We look forward to you coming back and getting us. We look forward to rising in the clouds with you, Jesus. Let, I just pray that we let God create our days for us, that we go to him first in the morning and we go to him last in the evening. Father, I pray for the poor and for the friendless, for one-parent homes. I pray that every word of God proves true, that you are a shield to all who come to you for protection. That never ends. Lord, I pray against discouragement because discouragement destroys. I pray that we replace that with trust. And uh, if we hear discouraging words, that we are able to add um, your promises. They never fail. And I think if we verbalize your promises, Lord, your word is miraculous, God. Help us to be forgivers, to be transformers. And lastly, Lord, I want to praise you for laughter. Laughter is, uh, I think it's the healing of our 
bodies and our minds. And we have so much, and I sit in church and I look before church and I listen to people talking together and laughing. It just brings joy to my heart, Lord. So I pray that you help each of us to have more laughter in our lives. I praise you and I pray that we honor you in everything we say and do, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. So this next song is a new song. Um, Sam sent it to me last week and said, I'd love for you and Rach to do this song. And you know, sometimes I, um, I don't really care what Sam wants, but in this case, I, uh, I listened to it. And honestly, I've had it on, I think I cried the first time I heard it. And then I listened to it like just on repeat like crazy the last week. So um, I wanted to read a little bit about the song, um, Just As Good. It can be incredibly easy to lose sight of the invisible and intangible God that we serve. We can be distracted by the very visible and very pressing concerns of our life, and we can quickly forget just how good our God has been to us. This can make us forget that God's love remains the same forever. He continues to bless us in ways that we cannot imagine through our hardest seasons. Just as good shows us that God is just as faithful and loving to us as he was from the beginning. We can weather any storm and have an unshakable faith in God if we keep with us a reminder of how good he has been in the past. So this song refers to Samuel's construction of an altar to serve as a reminder of God's goodness. The song reminds anyone who hears it of the steadfast and authentic love of Christ. Everyone needs a tangible reminder of God's goodness to look at in times of uncertainty. This song implores us to build our own Ebenezers and think of them often, lest we forget how faithful God has been and will always be. And I, um, to be honest, I had to Google what Ebenezer meant. Does anyone know what it means? Super, yes, no, that's not wrong. But when I Googled it, it it's, half, <laughs> it, it's half right. It's solid B plus or something. Um, it technically means stone of help. So I thought that was really cool. The visual of yes, an altar, but the individual stone is of help. So it's like, just picture all these things that you need help with and you're building that altar with every stone that you need help with as we're singing this song. Stuff 
forgetting my God that you've never left you right here with me still I'm convinced you're hiding oh God would you remind me you're still just as good as when I met you you're still just as kind don't let me forget that you're still the same God let me through the fire you're still the same God who separates the waters come do what only you can do God I need you you've done this before we'll do it again cause the waves are all around me and it feels like I'm drowning Great unknown 
to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. Our scripture reading today is Psalms 8. O Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your reputation throughout the earth. You reveal your majesty in the heavens above. From the mouths of children and nursing babies, you have ordained praise on account of your adversaries, so that you might put an end to the vindictive enemy. When I look up at the heavens which your fingers made and see the moon and stars which you set in place, of what importance is the human race that you should notice them? Of what importance is mankind that you should pay attention to them? Of what importance, oh, I just said that part. You made them a little less than the heavenly beings. You crowned mankind with your honor and majesty. You appoint them to rule over your creation. You have placed everything under their authority, including all the sheep and cattle, as well as all the wild animals as what the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that moves through the currents of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your reputation throughout the earth. I'm still best. I'm really hoping I'm on. I'm getting closer to being on. Somebody's going to think about turning me on today. We're getting there. I don't have a lot in me today, guys. That's a good thing for you. I'll keep it quick, maybe. Oh, let's pray. God, we thank you. We praise you. We are humbled and honored to be able to be in your presence, and we just pray that your spirit would fall upon us anew. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So it's interesting. I'm going to be honest. I'm not feeling well today. I think I've anybody who asks me, they're like, "Hey, how you doing?" I'm like, "Been better." Um, and and all morning, all last night, I struggled. I had this existential crisis because I'm. <laughs> so you guys don't know this, but pastors don't really like to call in sick the day of. It's worse than subplan, just so you know. Um, so I was really struggling with it, and I was like, and, and God kept saying, Katrina, you need to be at church. You, need to, you can do this. You can do this. You need to be at church. You might have to go to urgent care after, but you need to be at church. Um, and so I, I made my way, and I came, and I am so glad I did. Oh, my goodness. There are times, so let me say this. We have amazing praise teams, Okay. And I'm not trying to act like one praise team is somehow less impressive than the others or anything like that. But there are times when the praise team is really into it and the congregation is like, "Uh uh-huh, amen, praise God for you. We're not doing it. And then there are times when, like, the congregation is like, oh, we're worshiping today. And that's how it felt today. Like, just, it was good. It, It felt good. I almost was like, you know what? I don't have to say anything, but it's okay. I'm going to anyway. It's interesting, that first song. So here's what an Ebenezer is. And here's the only reason that I know. So my favorite hymn is Come Thou Found. It's a beautiful hymn. And so the last verse is, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. So I was like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what an Ebenezer is. So I had to look it up. And... um, So what it is, is, so Abraham or whoever would be going all over the place, and God would do like this amazing thing, right, to help them and and provide for them in some incredible way. And so they would build this monument and say, this is where God did blah, 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 blah. And then they would go on their way, and they would go someplace else, and God would do some other amazing thing, and then they would build another monument that said, this is where God did blah, 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 blah. Now that probably doesn't mean a whole lot, Um, for Abraham. But fast forward a couple hundred years when you're the children of Israel coming into a new land and you're walking through this new land and you're not entirely sure how God is going to pull off giving it to you and you run into one of these monuments and it says, this is where God did blah, blah, blah. How do you feel at that moment? You're like, oh, if he can do this, he can... I got this. God's got this. And it's this incredible thing. And so I oftentimes go back in my own head to those moments where I say, just a mental monument right here. This is where God made me leave Indiana. Made me. This is where God brought me to California. This is where God provided when I felt like there was no way. This is where God did something amazing. And when you have those moments that you can kind of look back on your life and point to, then when you run into something new and you're like, oh, I don't know if God can do it this time. And let's be real, we've all had those moments when we're like, I don't know, I don't know, like, I know. I know he says that his plans are to prosper me and not to harm me, but this kind of feels like the end right here. And then when you look back on those moments where God did this and this and this, and then you're like, oh, okay, God's got this. And you can breathe a little bit easier. It's interesting that that song was so powerful to me because today we are not looking at John. Oddly enough, we just decided not to. Today we're looking at Romans chapter 5. We, uh, we were playing around. We've been in the Gospels. We've been specifically in John for quite some time. And then we um, were kind of making the transition into a new um, book. We're going to go to Luke, I think. And so it was like, okay, so what do, what do we preach on this week? And I'm going to be honest, I kind of threw a hissy fit in Glenn's office. And he let me do Romans. So... Tantrums work, guys. <laughs> He's like, next time I'm going to say no. <laughs> and 
That's interesting. The good news for today comes from Romans chapter 5, and we're going to look at 1 through 5, but I'm going to read for you verse 3 because I find it hilariously ironic. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. That's what it says. I didn't make that up. The Bible says it. For we know that they help us develop endurance. Katie, can you <coughs> hook me up here? Thank you. So, so it's interesting. Today's sermon is not going to be helpful for anyone who has not experienced trials. If that's you, you're like, I've never gone through a struggle. I've never had a hard time. I'm not going to be offended if you get up and leave right now. Get yourself early to Olive Garden and enjoy. I'm going to be like, hey, it's not for you. Okay? If you've never gone through it, then just turn your ears off right now. So it's interesting, though, when I start going through my life, oddly enough, I have gone through struggles. And um, I started to ask myself this question. Why are there so many songs about suffering? So you guys try to fill in the blanks on some of these songs. I will send down a blank to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true. I will send down and I was like, come on, Alex. <laughs> Next one. I'm tired. I'm worn. My heart is blank. Now we've got an overachiever in the room. My heart is heavy from the work it takes to keep on breathing. The Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a blank in the time of storm. Shelter, there we go. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when blank like sea billows roll, sorrow. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the blank place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Hmm? Nope. Desert. Sorry. I tried to make sure there was enough of it that you could... My bad. My bad. It's okay. There are so many songs about suffering, and I picked good Christian songs. I almost picked some non-Christian songs, but then I thought... That might advertise the right, wrong thing, and you guys might think that I listen to secular music, and nobody would want that. So I picked Christian songs so that you guys would know that I'm a good Adventist. But it's so interesting how we spend so much time singing about struggles, singing about how hard life is, singing about how God has to make a way when there's no way. And this passage gives us insight into why it is that we can rejoice when we experience trials and tribulations. But it starts, and I want to give you the context for it. So it starts in verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. This is the context for all of the struggle that comes next. He says, let me explain to you, we are made right in God's sight by faith. Somebody's going to be like, but it's all grace. You're absolutely right. Wait for it. We're brought into this place of undeserved privilege, grace, by faith. God gives using the avenue of grace, but we have to receive it. We can be like, no, I don't want that. Thanks. Go away. And God's not going to be like, you will take my grace. He's not going to do it. He's going to be like, well, <laughs> that's weird. But okay. So, oh. so we receive by our faith what God gives by his grace. 
And what they're talking about here, this concept of being made right in God's sight, is what we call, the big word for it is what? Pastor Glenn? Starts with a J. Justification. It's one of those big words. Guys, you got to know the big words. Otherwise, people will think you're just an average Christian. You're like just following Jesus. So, justification. We are made right immediately right now in this moment when we accept God's gift of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are made right in this moment. Justification. Raise your hand if you are now perfect. That is not how any of this works. We have a different process for being made more and more into the character of God. We call that sanctification. You get justified, and then you got to get sanctified. This is how this works. So, we live in this dichotomy of the now and the not yet. That means that right now, we are seen as righteous in God's sight, and yet our character does not yet reflect such righteousness. It means that now we are set free from the power of sin and death, but we have not yet put on immora immortality. Immorality. Lord help us. Ooh, we've put on immorality, y'all. We wear it like a... Anyways... <laughs> We now have victory over our carnal nature and temptation, and we have not yet won every battle and stronghold in our lives. It's the now and the not yet. And that plays itself out when we look at the process God takes us through to become holy. Here's the deal. If it was easy... They'd call it football. Okay? So he goes on, he says, he goes through all of this, and he's having this whole discussion about justification and how we're made right in God's sight because of our faith and because God's grace is sufficient for us. And he goes through all of this, and then he says, we can rejoice too, too, as in also, meaning, and here's another benefit, Right? So he goes through and he says, we're justified, and that's great, but there's more. Wait, there's more. If you call now, you'll also get trials and tribulations. I don't think he knows what he's selling. He says, we can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials. And here's why he says we can rejoice. He says, here's the problem. Everyone on this planet will struggle. 100% of the people in this world are going to struggle. I think I talked about this a few months ago, and I said it was because our planet is the worst. I stand by that statement. But because Satan has such a strong grasp on this world, we will all experience struggles. Here's the thing. You can either experience struggles with God or without God. I know which way I'm going to vote. I'm just going to give you a picture here. With God, your struggle looks like purpose in your pain. Without God, it's just pointless suffering. That's what he says here. He says, here's why you can experience joy even in the midst of your suffering. Because when you're with God, not not. Everybody in the world is going to experience this. Those who are walking with God experience a purpose in the pain. And this is what he says the purpose is. He says, we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. He starts out, he says, when we have problems, that's the activating event. What comes next doesn't come next unless there's a struggle first. 
How many of us want to develop a good character? Guess what? What comes next can't come next without this first part. He says, the problems and the trials that you face are the activating event that God uses to develop endurance. Endurance, here's how this works, endurance is surviving what you think will kill you. How that works. Here's the benefit of that for us. Sometimes we talk about endurance and we're like, yeah, if you come out on the other side and you are a better person, no, 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 no. You don't have to be a better person on the other side. Endurance just means you survived it. So think about a struggle that you faced in your life. That cute boy who did not think you were cute. And you were pretty certain you weren't going to survive this. And then something weird happened because your body went... And you were still alive. Think about that struggle that you went through where you genuinely don't know how it happened, but one minute you had a job and the next minute you didn't, and you were trying to figure out how you were going to take care of your family, and then the weirdest thing happened because you were pretty certain that that was going to be the end of it, and then you went, <sighs> it's the most amazing thing. It's like our bodies are designed to survive. We go through this and we endure struggles. We survive what feels unsurvivable. And we look back at it, and because we're walking with God, the thing that we look back and see is, oh, I didn't survive that by myself. I didn't walk that path alone. I didn't go through that all alone. And so you look back and you say, God is really good at his job. So you go through your life and you start shifting how you experience trials, how you endure the trial. And so you stop thinking, I'm not going to be able to survive this. And you start finding yourself with these little breath prayers of, God, just keep me now. God, I trust you. God, I believe your word is true. And you start walking in the truth that is God's word. And here's what happens when you walk consistently with God over an extended period of time. He changes you. Notice that I did not say, you change yourself. It would be real nice and convenient if I could be like, you know what? I'm going to be a better person. Today, starting today, I'm going to be a good person. And then it just works. Raise your hand if that worked for you. No. He changes you. You find yourself walking and you're frustrated and you're overwhelmed and you're tired. But because you keep trusting him. He softens those rough edges. And so while what used to come out of your mouth towards your husband was you, <laughs> blessed child of God, now, because you're walking with God and trusting God, he says, <sighs> you know, honey, I really don't like it when you leave your socks on the floor. I don't know. Is that a thing? It's hard for me. <laughs> the marriage examples are hard for me because I leave my socks on the floor, so I don't know how it works. <laughs> but we go through this, and, and because God is working in us and demonstrating his power through us, our character gets shifted. More and more, we start to look like the God we serve. Not because we did some profound thing, not because we spun around in circles ten times and touched our nose, and, and no. Because God is just like that. Because he pours his spirit into us. He sustains us by his power, and he transforms us from one moment to the next, 
more and more into his character. And then something amazing happens. If you're anything like me, this amazing thing will happen. Because you'll look at your life now versus how you were back then and go, oh, if God can do that, he can do the rest too. And suddenly, and this is one of my least favorite words, but I'm going to use it anyway, suddenly you have a thing called hope where you think maybe this nightmare that I'm in right now isn't the end of the world. That can't be right. You started out over here where everything, you were like, I'm going to die right now. This is the end of me. And then time goes by, and you're going through things, and you're learning things, and you're understanding what God is trying to do in your life, and you're like, maybe I can be at peace right now. And let me tell you something, when you look like you're at peace in the midst of a trial that other people know you're going through, they have questions. They have questions about how it is that you, how are you that under control at a time when clearly everything in your life is on fire? Because we know that this place is not our home. You start to realize as you become more and more like him, as you see him as he truly is, you begin to realize that you don't have to live in this nightmare forever. And so you allow God to do what only he can do and sustain you until you get to go home. This is no longer about thriving in a place that's a nightmare. Now it's about, okay, just keep me here until it's time to go home. Problems do three things for us. Number one, they show us how powerful God is. Number two, they smooth our rough edges. And number three, they remind us that we aren't home yet. We see this in the story of Daniel as he's held captive. And he offers, for his endurance, a 10-day test. I could not complete this test. I'm not going to lie. Just veggies for me. For 10 days. He resolved to obey God, and God blessed him and sustained him as a result of it. And what we see is that God is able to use him, despite his captivity, as the great Daniel of Babylon. We see it in Moses' story. Moses, who killed a guy and was on the lamb. Sometimes our messes are our own construction. Like, nobody made this mess for you. You made this mess for yourself. And yet, in Moses' story, in enduring in the wilderness for those years... God provided him with a family. God provided with him with a job. He calmed his temper back down so that he could lead the nation of Israel. It's interesting to see how God works in the midst of our struggles, but it's never something we can do for ourselves. And here's where it ends. It says, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. Because God has already given us a down payment. It says, we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. He fills us with his spirit as a down payment for what we know is coming next. So that we don't have to try to fight the battles on our own. Try to go through struggles on our own. Instead, Every step of the way, we have a God who is with us, in us, and working through us.
It's okay if it's hard to believe I have faith that you will do greater things It's my time to go But before I leave Power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory be to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 